Okay, welcome back to another episode of Rebel Rock Money Talk and our special series as we continue um, for Black History Month. My featured guest today is Billy Keel. Hi, Billy. Hey, Leslie, how are you? I am really <laughs> looking forward to today's conversation. It's great to see you again. Yes, I'm so glad to have you on. Thank you for making the time to speak with our, uh, with our audience. Um, I wanted to speak with you for many, many reasons. I heard your story and thought you were so fascinating. And as everyone knows that the reason I selected the folks um, as part of this Black History Month special feature is because I consider them to be independent thinkers. They've, they're either doing or have done some really incredible, just out, out the box thinking, or just had some type of taken a path that's just not you know, what everyone else does. And I just thought, I really want to learn more about them and really want you to hear more about their story. And so Billy, I felt like I really related to you because I'm similarly an expat. <laughs> I was born in Canada and now I live in the US. So I live thousands of miles away from my family. Um, but you know, I've made a life and I'm happy. So Billy, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? So let's start with your childhood. Yes. Um, yeah. So I grew up in Columbus, Ohio. And, and let's just say from the very beginning, you're going to want to stick around for a little bit to find out where I actually live. And I can promise you that it's not Columbus, Ohio. It's right. kind of far, <laughs> like really far, um, really, far. really, really far. So yes. Yeah, so originally from Columbus, Ohio, um, I was I was born there. We stayed there for a number of years, and then we kind of moved around a little bit. But uh, I'll keep it short and sweet so far. So I'm I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio. Okay, great. And so you went to school there, graduated high school there. Yeah. So I mean, it was kind of a it's interesting story. Interesting story because we went kind of around. I, I think right around three or four weeks old, something like that, or a couple of months uh, when my parents moved to uh, Denver, Colorado. And then in Denver, my brother and sister were born. So I'm the oldest of three. Um, we moved out there because my dad was looking to move us away and and have start kind of their own life with him and my mom. And um, then after that, w they stayed there for a while, but there were, then they had a calling to go to Houston, Texas. And so we moved to Houston. My dad was working in the energy space and the oil and gas uh, for for a company there out in the oil fields and my mom was uh, a teacher and doing a number of things but my parents had some marital problems and because of that long story kind of short they eventually separated and so my mom went back to ohio with me and my brother and sister my dad stayed in texas now they ended up reconciling they reconciled for a little while but eventually it didn't work, right? And so <laughs> okay. they finally, they divorced. We were back in Columbus. Um, my dad ended up moving out to New York or New York City area. Uh, my brother and sister and I were living in Columbus with my mom. I went away. I was one of the first to go to college ever. Uh, I went to college at Miami of Ohio in the southwest part of uh, the state of Ohio, just north of Cincinnati. And I have two degrees. One is a... Um, it's kind of funny to even say a BS in marketing and a BA in uh, <laughs> in Spanish. And uh, after that, I had an amazing, amazing, amazing job, um, Leslie, that really kind of, I think, started the real change in my life. Because in five years, I had the opportunity to work and travel throughout some 58 different countries and always staying in five-star accommodation. So it was like unbelievable. It was like the most unbelievable thing I'd ever uh, come across. And then, uh, yeah, so I was there and that was before I made the leap to somewhere closer to where I am now, but, uh, yeah, five years, 58 countries and, um, just an amazing, amazing opportunity, professional opportunity after college. Right. And so what area, like what field were you working in that, you know, gave you that opportunity to travel so much? Yeah, so I was working for a performance improvement company. The company's called Merits, and they're based in St. Louis, Missouri. And I actually worked for the travel company. And so what that means is, I actually worked, there were like, we worked with really, really big companies, Microsoft, Ford Motor Company, uh, Toyota. And so they would typically do two types of meetings. One where they had like top achievers, like what I would consider like winner circle president's club. And they would send like the top 50 um, agents to this, you know, Botswana and Safari, which was amazing. But there was people that actually planned those trips. But then they needed people to actually fly to Botswana, go to Maun and be there in the safari for like a week before to make sure that everything was going just fine. And then be there when all of the guests were there to make sure that everything went well, because we were the interfaces between our company, 
the company that hired us in the locals. And so for five years, that's what I was doing. I was like 21 to 26 or something like that. And it was pretty amazing. Like there aren't, those roles still exist, but not like they did kind of in the late to, to mid to late nineties. And it was pretty, uh, pretty amazing opportunity. I could not imagine being able to do that in my early twenties. <laughs> that is like the dream yeah, it job. Was, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> I had a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then tell us. Um, okay. So you made you made it through all these different countries, and you landed yep. where you are now. Tell us about how you got to where you are now. Yeah. Cool. So so uh, before I tell everybody where I am now, we'll kind of go back to to where I was in St. Louis. Oh, and so sure. after that five years after that five years, fifty eight countries, um, I didn't actually see myself doing a quote unquote normal job, right? And so I applied, I was like, well, what can I do? Da, da, da. I'd saved a lot of money. And then I was like, okay, well, you know, why don't I just do a one-year sabbatical? And so I applied to university. I got accepted to a university in Paris called the Sorbonne, um, or as they would say in, in Paris, La Sorbonne. And so it was amazing, right? And I was there, I was, and I went to Paris. I was there to learn more about these French language and culture. I wanted to learn how to salsa dance, Cuban style. <laughs> And I also wanted to learn more about wine. And so I went Cuban there. style dancing? You wanted to learn that in France? Yeah, it was kind of crazy. I, I just wanted <laughs> to learn salsa. I didn't really know anything. I just I wanted to learn salsa dancing. But when I got there, I <laughs> took Cuban style salsa dancing. So I, I you know, I was like, okay, I didn't, I didn't know the difference, but there's definitely a difference. Um, and so I was there. It was supposed to be a one year sabbatical. And then I was going to go back to the US. I was going to probably get a job at some big company and just kind of stay there. Well, as good fortune would have it, um, I was there for a year. It was amazing. And then I actually, when I meet, met a lot of these real Fortune 500 CEOs, they were like, oh, yeah, if you ever need anything, give us a call. Uh, and I didn't know any difference. Like, I was 21 to 26, right? I was, yeah, sure, whatever. As you know, you're keeping these cards. I never realized how difficult it would be to get back to, to those people, right? Because it was just my normal day to day. But anyway, um, I ended up, I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to stay. So I started working in the IT sector. I left Paris. I moved to a town called Montpellier and I was living there. I stayed there for about two and a half years. Uh, I was also in Italy for about six months to start up a sales team there um, working for Dell. And so this was all IT remote. Uh, remote sales motion. So I didn't know anything about that either. And uh, then I went back to France and eventually ended up moving to Barcelona, Spain or Barcelona, where I live, have been living since uh, July of 2005. Uh, got married and have two kids. So I, I always kind of joke and say that one year sabbatical turned into um, a marriage, three countries and two kids. And so you never know when you take those one year sabbaticals, what they can end up being. Right. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's kind of how I got here. <laughs> that's amazing. That's an amazing story. So I actually, so I heard one really important thing I wanted to just point out because I'll forget. Um, but uh, one is um, access, right? I mean, right. your ability to have access to those people, um, for them to get to see how you work, your professionalism, your energy, they were like, mm, hey, they want to make sure that you knew if there's, if you ever, you know, want to come work our way, come on in. And that's not always something that um, we get an opportunity to do is to network with people at that level. But the second yeah. was that you were, you know, you were fearless. <laughs> you just said, I'm going to, I'm going to go, I'm going to, I'm going to move to Montpellier and see what happens. And I'm going to yeah. try these different opportunities and you weren't afraid. And so where do you think that that confidence comes from? Um, I, I think it comes like now that I think about it in retrospect, so I, I kind of cut down some of the story. So when we moved from Ohio to Colorado, like within Colorado, my parents moved a couple of times and then we went to Texas and we were in Houston and they moved a couple of times as well. Like my parents were, are, are, you know, they worked really, really hard, right? They taught us the values of work hard and, you know, you work hard and if you're fortunate enough, you're going to save some money and you'll be able to do these kinds of things. And so what that meant was usually every year. I don't know if that was just random because like when the uh, when the leases ended on the rent on the rental agreements, we had to move to like maybe it's a coincidence. I don't know. Um, but I was frequently like the new kid in class. My brother and sister, too. Like uh, the fact that I was always with my brother and sister, that was great. But we were frequently the new kids in class. And so that kind of it was difficult as a young kid because I always had to adapt and meet new people. And, you know, sometimes I was like the only kid who looked like me and. Um, and it was just difficult. But I think when you realize and you go through that over and over and over and over is one of the greatest gifts that my parents actually gave to us. 
because we had to adapt and learn and adjust and constantly think about, is this the way or is this the way that I'm thinking about it because this is what I'm used to. And so I would say that that, that ability to adapt, to recognize the situation really comes from uh, something that was a difficult thing as a kid and just having had so many reps, eventually it became kind of one of part of my, one of my superpowers today. And so I, I'm really thankful to my parents and for my parents for giving us the opportunity to have to adjust so many times in new in new locations with new people. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's yeah, I can totally relate to that. <laughs> um, mm. Okay, so now we're in Barcelona, and so mm -hmm. what do you do now in Barcelona? So, um, aside from being dad and husband, so that's kind of like the things that I, I'm trying to do all the time. I mm -hmm. Um, I have two kind of two roles and I think this is where you're, what you're asking me. So number one, mm -hmm. I am a, I consider myself a happy corporate employee. So I've been working uh, for a very large, the, the market leading enterprise software company where I sell application software to some of the largest clients in Spain, where I'm typically selling in Spanish and Catalan language, which is the language that they speak here uh, locally in the area that I live in, in Barcelona. Um, and I really enjoy that. And I enjoy that because I go there every day because I want to go there every day, right? Not the, I don't have to go there. And I guess that's right. kind of what makes me a happy corporate employee. Uh, at the same time, for the last seven years, I've been building my own business. And that business is related to what I thought in the beginning, Leslie, was real estate. But I realized that it's actually tangible assets, like real assets. That's what I like to invest in. Um, some people call them... Um, alternative uh, investments. Uh, I saw a really good quote. There's a guy named Spencer that I still don't even know. I've just seen him online. He's like, well, these real estate wasn't the, it's not an alternative investment. It's like the original <laughs> investment. Yeah. And I thought that's kind of funny. Um, and, and so I, I'm basically living between these two worlds, right? In the daytime, I am working at my corporate job, which is something that I have really enjoyed. Like I said, I'm a happy corporate employee and I'm doing that role. And then in the afternoons, evenings, weekends, I'm building my own dream based around something, like I said, that are what most people will call uh, alternative assets. But like I was mentioned before, it's like the original asset. So these are kind of the ways or the areas that I'm really, really focusing my time and my energy nowadays uh, when I'm not being a, a dad and a, and a, and a husband. <laughs> I love that. So the first thing I'd like to ask is, uh, I guess, how do you balance the time? I mean, being, you know, an executive at a large global enterprise company um, and then having the time to, you know, build your other business in the, in the, off, in the off time. So I'm not someone who needs a lot of sleep, I guess, to start off with. So in that <laughs> regards, I'm also very, very fortunate uh, because I sleep very little. Um, and the, the, the reality is today I have team members that are as far east as the Philippines and as far west as California. So as you can imagine, kind of working in between. And now as I start to scale up the 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 company, my my own small enterprise, um, it's just one of these things where I, I start early in the day and I typically will work on my own business. Uh, then once we get to quote unquote corporate hours, then I kind of do that non, then I kind of shut off my own business now that I have team members, things are moving even without me being there. So that's a really great thing because we've set up the process or the process and things are working without me, right? Well, one of the things that we're now doing, because I have someone who maps out all of our processes and standard operating procedures is we look at, depending on what it is, is it something that is revenue generating? Well, I may need to be involved if it's something that is really uh, about making sure that we're just running efficiently. The idea is to make sure that Billy is even not in the process, or if so, that he's as like has few touches as possible and they have to be absolutely critical touches. So being disciplined about the time that I am focused on my own business, for, focused on the corporate and also focused on my family, then when I have a little bit of time for myself, then I'll, I'll focus in, and do those kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it's it's really about having the discipline to know when I'm working and, and also making sure that I have time for myself. That's, that is one of the things that I make sure that I do every single day. I kind of, well, I start the first hour of every day by myself and focusing on myself. And I have a little, I have a ritual that I go through for the first hour of the morning. Uh, but aside from that, it's, it's about making sure that I understand where I want to go for the, um, for the quarter, for the month, for the week, uh, et cetera, et cetera. 
No, that's excellent. I love that discipline. <laughs> Um, I think there's a lot of people who are in corporate and they might be happy corporate people, but they also know that there's something else they want to do and they may not have quite figured out how they should go about doing it. So it's good that you've been able to do that. So why don't you tell us a little bit about some of these, you know, alternative investments. I love that you brought up the, you know, the comment that the guy Spencer made, because it's kind of like how I feel about my business. Like, I feel like I'm not a typical, you know, advisor because I don't, talk about what's known as the typical stuff. And that's because it's, to me, it's all the new stuff. A lot of stuff that I teach is stuff that's been around for, you know, centuries, <laughs> but yeah. is maybe considered not, you know, typical just because of that. So it, it's a, it aligns in that way. Um, so tell us more about some of the tangible assets and or alternative investments that you're involved in. Yeah. And so even before I say that, I mean, it, you know, thanks, thanks to, to you, Leslie, and a lot of the things that you're doing, the education that you continue to put out. I mean, the people that are here with you consistently week in, week out, I mean, they're already doing things that most people aren't doing. So you kind of put them in the one percenters anyway. Uh, and at the same time, because of there's a, such a lack of education, uh, it's a real benefit when we can learn from you because you are helping to shed light on things that for whatever reason, the mainstream don't want us to know, right? And because they don't want us to know, many times it's holding us back from really creating the lifestyle that we truly want to create. And a lot of that starts with having financial independence. Absolutely. And I don't mean that you need to be a multi-billionaire, like that's not the thing. It's being able to literally have freedom to decide that you're going to go to your corporate job like me yeah. or not, right? right. And today I, I choose to go to the corporate job there will probably be a day where I choose not to go to the corporate job. And a lot of that starts out by being able to really understand and surround yourself with people like you, Leslie, that are helping us to become more educated on the things that are, are maybe a little bit in the shade and you're, you're continuing to help to bring, uh, bring them to, to light. So um, with that stated, yeah, yeah, sure. And, um, and just, you know, going back to the, the alternative investments, right? Yeah. Uh, there are, so I've focused on a lot of things and I really take it in two different flavors because there's what I've been doing actively and what I've been doing passively. Um, and I'll, I'll, maybe I'll start with the passive because I didn't even know that passive investing existed, right? Um, well, no, yeah, we'll stay with passive. Like I had already purchased um, multiple small multifamily properties and a mobile home park before I even knew that multi that um, passive investing existed. Mm -hmm. And so once I found out that passive investing existed, it was kind of like, oh my gosh, like I can always have my money on the treadmill, <laughs> on the treadmill. It doesn't matter. Like I can do it myself or I can entrust my capital and my goals and my dreams to other people, right? I need to vet them and all that kind of stuff and make sure that it works. But um, then I, you know, I've invested in um, things like ATM machines. Like most people would be like, well, why would you even do that? Like nobody's using cash and stuff like that. And you're like, well, actually, if you do the studies and you look at the numbers and kind of see what's going on and understand who the customer the customer is, yeah. and you'll see that there really is a, a need uh, for uh, ATM machines. And if we can provide that service, the operator can provide that service. Well, I'd like to partake in that, right? Um, then there's also larger multifamily that are, you know, 250 plus unit building where we're bringing other people that have goals and aspirations similar to me financially and are willing to place our capital and sleep well at night um, on larger multifamily buildings, right? So those are things that I've done uh, passively. I've also been involved in a development project uh, where we are, have a, an 82 room hotel. It is a Hilton branded hotel. And, you know, that that's something else I've done passively. Um, and then on the active side of things, as I mentioned, the smaller multifamily, uh, as well as mobile home parks and something that I've just recently gotten a lot of energy around and, and just uh, finished a, a raise of about one point five million dollars is in the space, the energy space, which is something that I really didn't know much about at all. Um, but when I start looking at all of these different assets, there are two things that really resonate with me as a high wage earner uh, and someone who also interacts a lot with people that have um, retirement accounts or retirement plans, however you want to look at it, 401ks, IRAs, and stuff like that, is mm -hmm. looking to create predictable streams of income, right? Number one, so consistent cash flow and tax benefits. And so when I see those things that exist, I tend to gravitate towards those things. And the people that are part of my family or part of my tribe 
also tend to gravitate towards those types of things. And that's kind of how I've gotten to this point in time. And as I'm having more and more control of my own financial life and really helping others to gain more control over their financial life, creating predictive streams of, of cash flow and, and more tax benefits. So that's another way that I'm kind of living in these between these two worlds and how I'm focused on um, the the alternative quote unquote asset space. <laughs> Yeah, no, I love that. I, I love that. Um, the, first of all, the diversity, right? I, I always kind of try to help people understand that even even if you're, you know, even if you don't want to invest in, in Wall Street and you just want to do real estate, well, diversify across Wall Street, you know, or sorry, diverse across, um, diversify across real estate. You are yep. doing tangible assets. Well, diversify across tangible assets because you just never, ever want to have all your, you know, as I say, eggs in one basket. So I love all of that that you're doing. Yeah, you know, it was really interesting. Um, if I can just say one thing, because I was talking about yeah. to, to someone about this earlier, and they said, "Well, you know, Billy, you're kind of you're you're doing so many different things." And I said, "Well, actually, not really. Like, I'm just doing one thing." Um, because when I look at my own business, I am someone who is a a, a real uh, asset, like tangible asset syndicator. Like, I enjoy things that are simple that I can understand the process. And I see that there is an opportunity to participate um, either myself or bring it to my investors. So what I spend my time doing is really building an ecosystem and making sure that my team and my brand, that we are aligned with world class operators and those operators, their function is to make sure that the dreams and the goals that our investors, you know, that my investors, our investors, that they entrust their goals and dreams to us, that when it comes down to the execution, I count on our partners to be able to deliver on the day in day out operations. And so that's the one thing that I do. And so whether that partner is extremely talented and world class in operating very large pieces of equipment in the energy sector or um, managing and operating a business travelers hotel. Well, I want to make sure that we're aligned with the people that are doing the day to day work, but they're the experts in their kind of domain. I just am an expert of going out and meeting the right members of the team, vetting the team and making sure that they're aligned with our goals, our missions and our values. Mm -hmm. Ho hopefully that makes sense. That makes complete sense. It makes total sense. And it kind of leads into what I was going to ask you next, because I don't know, people might not have quite made the connection yet if they don't know you, but you are, as you just mentioned, living in Spain, <laughs> but yeah. you do all your investing in the US, correct? Yes, so 100 percent. It's critical for you to have, you know, kind of done your due diligence and and vet all these different operators. So can you talk a little bit about that, like just that whole experience of, you know, being thousands of miles away and all your business and investments are here? Sure. And and this is where, you know, I, I'm just I'm such a big believer in that, that you know, that hashtag teamwork makes the dream work right? because <laughs> because it just yeah. is because I, I genuinely believe most people when I got into real estate, I read the books and I understood the books to mean that I live in this city. I buy property in this city and I go check on my place and I get two to three hundred dollars a month from this place and I was going to do it. And so when I realized that I live in Barcelona, Spain, and I read that little purple book and the numbers weren't working in the same way as it was explaining in the book, because I was living in an appreciation based market, not in a cash flow market. I didn't know that at the time. Now I do. Um, I started realizing, well, OK, well, the day that I bought my my first small duplex 6000 miles away, or however many thousands of kilometers away, I realized, wow, you know what? I can actually live anywhere in the world that I want. I mean, we closed on the property. My wife and I were in Egypt uh, and we closed on the property. I live in Barcelona and the property was back stateside. So I started realizing like, okay, that was about just buying and, and filling out my portfolio. But then when I started realizing how can I best serve my investor pool, it was they want to be able to live anywhere. I live here in where I choose to invest is in the United States, like exclusively as of today. I mean, I haven't seen anything that would make our my company wanted to pivot any other place. Um, and it really is about making sure that 
um, starting with relationships. I, I at this point, I start with relationships. I also invest my time. I invest my money to fly back to the United States to go to different conferences, to meet with different people, make a special flight, you know, to City X to sit down with someone who is a very well-known partner in their in their space, and that could be in self storage, that could be in multifamily, and and that could be in the energy sector, right? Because I want to make sure that I actually understand the person get the feel are we are we aligned could we could we do business together um are they able to bring value to to my clients to my investors um and then being able to see also too what's the track record how you know is this something that's just getting started or do we have you know four five six ten years that we can actually look back in terms of historical of being able to produce results consistently great business ethics and, and these types of things so and then eventually you get to a point where you say okay well we're going to take all these different feelings that we have and we're going to put them on paper and we're going to come up with a a some type of a uh, this is probably not the right legal word, but we're going to come up with a partnership and you're going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to bring the capital. You're going to bring the expertise and da, da, da. And, and it's going to be a situation that is beneficial for our investors, uh, for co your company and for my company. Mm -hmm. So awesome. hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, it makes total sense. I love this. Um, all right. So, Billy, you also have a podcast. So I definitely want to give you a chance to let people know a little bit about that, because I think that, you know, other high net worth earners who are listening to this or people who've been thinking about, you know, dabbling into alternative investments, whether you're clients of mine or just people who've been listening and following, um, you know, Billy has a lot of information out there available. He has, you know, been very generous in, in sharing, um, speaking with other people who are doing, you know, similar type of investments. And so how can people hear and, you know, get to hear what you've been sharing? Yeah, sure. So, and I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about the podcast. So the, the podcast is the Going Long Podcast with Billy Keels. The whole concept there is we want people to feel much more comfortable and confident investing beyond their backyard. And whether you choose to invest in a, uh, a mobile home park or a multifamily building or a piece of energy equipment, we want to provide you with the tools based on interviews with the best experts and real Main Street investors that I know. And we're just, they allow me the opportunity to come and ask a bunch of questions. And I'm always thinking about, you know, what would my, what would my, um, my family member who's part of the Going Long podcast family, what would they want to know? Right. And so I get a chance to ask uh, a lot of them questions so that my, so that my audience can go and take action. Right. We don't also one of the other things. And I know, Leslie, this is why people are here with you. Right. They, they like to take action. They don't want to just sit here and listen and consume yeah. the, the information. They're consuming the information to be able to make the best decision to take some type of action. And that is what we continue to promote at the at the Going Long podcast with Billy Keels is, is really bringing people uh, together so that they can understand more about the U.S. based real asset uh, market. So I guess I'm curious about this for the people who are, you know, the investor, people who are investing with you, what percentage would you say are, I guess, non-US investors and what percent are, you know, are live in the US? Do you have to Yeah, so we, <laughs> Yeah, so so um I would say today the the majority, I want to say it's roughly 65%, something like that, uh of the investors no, maybe 60%, sorry, 60% are based in the United States. The others are based outside of the United States, primarily Europe uh, and Latin America, Europe and Latin America. Interesting. I'm yeah. curious about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Which, which actually keep, kind of keeps us on our toes because it makes it um, – it, it makes it interesting. Like we, we talked about uh, things before, like depending on how people earn their income, where they earn their income, depending on the opportunity, it could be more or less advantageous uh, for that person. Right. right. And I'm sure we'll talk about some of that stuff uh, in the future. But like if you're thinking about someone who is um, having passive income and, and I mean passive income as in non-active income as the IRS states in the United States, um, if you earn your income that way, then you may be able to take lots of losses in that same particular bucket. But if you earn your income from a day job and you're investing in um, uh, in other types of passive uh, assets, then you, you may have this big bucket of passive losses, but you can't really, it doesn't really help you with your day job. Like, and of course we're not doing any, like not giving anybody advice. Everybody needs to talk to their own tax professionals about this kind of stuff. But what it does is having people from different places, different countries, it really, um, as we sit down and we talk in a very similar way that you do, you wouldn't really take in the whole picture. It's th the same way because we want to understand what's the income strategy, what's your tax strategy and bring all that together so that ultimately the investors can make the best decision 
for themselves because you may ask, well, why would somebody in Spain invest in an asset that's in the United States? Well, because if we sat down and you understand what they're trying to achieve and they recognize that the best way for them to achieve what they're trying to achieve is to go long distance and invest somewhere else, that the return, that risk adjusted return is better for them and they're going to sleep well at night. Well, you know what? Then they're going to do that. So, but that's part of a, being a, being very, very close to to the investors and understanding really what it is that they're trying to uh, to achieve. Yeah, I love it. I love it, Billy. Well, thank you again. I really appreciate the time that you've taken to speak with me today and to share all this, you know, wisdom with the audience. I will definitely be directing them links to your podcast, your YouTube channel also has a lot of great information in addition to your podcast. Um, and all that will be in the show notes. So thank you so much, Billy. I'm going to have to say, I'm going to say, oh, wow. I don't think I told you that I speak a little bit of French growing up in Canada. No, je ne savais pas. Bah, c'est super. <laughs> <laughs> Merci. Now, quickly, though, how many languages do you speak and what are those languages? Yeah, so I have been very, very fortunate. I speak five languages. So um, not including what the what the, what the what the Brits would say. The Brits say I I, I only I speak American. So uh, <laughs> so so I'll say I speak American slash English. Um, I also speak French. I speak Spanish, Catalan, which is the language they speak here in the area that I live in, Barcelona, and Italian. Man. So. Yeah. So having lived in those places and know, I, and I know what it's like to be very, very frustrated and almost crying on the phone. And yeah, OK, yeah, I'll admit it. I was crying sometimes on the phone, just frustrated, like I just want to get my water turned on. I just need this fixed and nobody helped. <laughs> it's just like, but eventually you learn, you know, you, you learn. So that's amazing. So, yeah, Love man. it. I can't wait to get to Italy, Barcelona. I think I shared with you. I've been to Spain, but not Barcelona. So can't wait for COVID well, to be ready, over. So ready to, when you're ready, you let me know. You let me know. I will. I'll definitely let you know. But thank you so much, Billy. I appreciate your time today and we will talk soon. All right. Thanks so much, Leslie. Appreciate it. Okay. Thank you.